Hi, Steve. Hey, Jim. So what do you know about hazing in the vinyl community? Shh. Okay. If you want to join the vinyl community, yes, you have to go through something. It may be outlawed, but it just doesn't matter. Thank you, sir. May I have another? <laughs> yes. And welcome once again to Two Guys Talking About Records, a vinyl community podcast. Each week, we two guys get together, been doing it for many years now, and we talk about records. That's right, for years and years, <laughs> and we're still talking about them. We haven't even talked about them all yet. We haven't. That's why it's, it's so cool. There's so much more to talk about. Hey, my name is Jim, and I am a record store owner. And I'm Steve, a record collector. Now, we should probably clarify this a little bit. By years, we meant you and I have been talking about records for years. That's the podcast, right. yes. a little over a year, 74 yep. episodes now. Holy mackerel. Moving along. But how many episodes could we have had if we had just started when we started <laughs> doing, talking every Sunday for it years? It would have been years worth, Steve. Yeah. Years. Hey, so this week on the podcast, uh, we're going to talk about hazing and the, uh, the the light ribbing and the uh, intro aside, this is a serious issue. Not the hazing like when you join a fraternity and they... Or the vinyl uh, they, community. They make, yeah, and vi yeah, the vinyl community fraternity. How's that? The fraternity yeah. of vinyl community content creators. Uh, we, we're not going to make you wear a funny hat or spank you with a paddle or anything like that. No, but this is actually a pretty serious issue. It's just, it's been around for a, lot, a while. A lot of stuff I've read, people have been talking about it, but it's gotten some new light recently. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, yeah, it's just suddenly, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, first one I saw was uh, from Frank 33 RPM. And then I've seen the other channels jump in on this. And so, yeah, there's we'll, it's, it's definitely an interesting topic. We will get into this here in a little bit because it's, it's, it's interesting, but it also alludes to an age old argument. So we'll get to this in just a couple of seconds. But being that this is the vinyl community, not a really exclusive club, mind you. Anybody can come in. <laughs> uh, but one thing we like to do is talk about pickups. And each week we add to our collections. I've had a decent week this week. How about you, sir? Well, you know, last week I, I said not much, but look out. Yeah, this 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 was a big one. <laughs> so, oh my! Uh, oh my! Uh, Did you get so a package? We, we 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 well, I got your package and more. Okay. So we may not have time to talk about hazing, Jim. Uh, okay, well, let me check my. There we go. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> all right. Holy cow! You had yeah. you grunted when you picked the load up. I know. Yeah, isn't that bad? Um, the first one is a group called Crush. And kind of a shoegaze dream pop type band. This is their brand new album that they put out. Actually, it's not. It came out in 2023. It's not oh. a brand new album. And look what I, I have to say. I, I know nothing about it. Somehow I heard this. Somehow I got interested in it. Haven't a clue how, but it's right up my alley. It's very nice. Female lead singers kind of buried beneath beautiful guitars and stuff. Uh, again, pedal effects going on. Uh, yeah, very nice stuff. Group's called Crush. Cool. From uh, Jim said, I, I bought some stuff from Radio Wasteland Records. And, uh, You're so, local? Yeah, we have here. Uh, this is the group. SOM, SOM. And oh, so yeah. Jim, that's the shape of everything. Uh, shoegaze from 2022. Uh, I have no idea who they were. Jim just said, Hey, shoegaze, what? And I, oh, okay, just send it to me. You know, it's like, it's what it's just money, so I can't take it with me. I might as well just have this album instead. Uh, looking and, out for you, man. Yeah, it's and it's pretty good. I, I, I like it, I enjoyed that. And uh, Jim goes, Hey, I got this in. Uh, you might be interested in the propeller heads. Mm -hmm. And I had a, I think I, I've had them on compilations, you know, from the nineties, they really only had one album, but they had their big, their big hit, you could say and they're, they're from the UK. So this is um, kind of techno electronic. 
um, dance, whatever. But they did um, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. And that's the soundtrack from James Bond, Her Majesty's okay. Secret Service. They do their own version of it, electronic style. It's actually quite good. Uh, yeah, there's some songs that are kind of, yeah, whatever. And, but then, then there's some very good ones on here. So uh, from the 90s, it's kind yeah. of always neat to get albums from the 90s, you know, out of the UK, propeller heads. Now, I knew those guys, they had a they had a cut, at least one, if not more, on the Matrix soundtrack, which was just real yes. driving industrial. Very, very true. Yes. All right. From Fuzz Club, I brought in another Glutz. So I showed that one Glutz a couple yeah. weeks back, and it was like one of my favorite albums of the year. So oh, why not just go back in the back catalog very hard to get uh again italian punk band are kind of not even necessarily punk but post-punk I, I would say this is more hard rocking and uh yeah i was able to find generally it's hard to find anybody distributing them in the u.s i found only one person had them in the u.s dearborn records oh wow um, here yeah. the south of us they're exactly. a big, big store too. So yes, they are. So uh, I grabbed that. I I, I did a. Uh, I went to a record store this week. It, I I was debating on it because when I looked it up, it says, "Well, we specialize in metal." <laughs> like oh, what, what? What do I know on metal, man? I mean, I I am not the metal head, but it did say punk also. So I went there, and it was some of the best prices I've found in in all oh, of good. Metal. And I picked up uh, the DBs. I thought you might want to know. This is their early material uh, before they got onto a major label. And they have uh, one of these is, um, I think it's called The Fight. I can't remember which one, but it's on a lot of compilations. Uh, but, yeah, I, it's just really, this, this is very, very good. Very excited about that. I've picked this up. Mofi Jerry Rafferty. Oh, wow. Now, I talked about this a few weeks back. I went to a, a record store called Angelo's, and they, mm -hmm. they had it on the wall, and I was really excited because I've wanted this. I pull it down. They're wanting $100, which is its medium price. The cover is good plus. They even rated it good plus. The vinyl, VG minus, if lucky, and they wanted $100. Wow. So I go to a heavy metal place. <laughs> it's on the wall, 80 bucks. And it's very good cover, excellent vinyl. He had some Mofis come in. I don't know, this 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 one didn't sell. Can you believe the metal heads aren't jumping at looking into it? Yeah, they just aren't not jumping at city to city. I don't get it, but hey, it was there for me. You know, oh my god, there it is. And you got uh, a deal. Yeah, I did yeah. notice on the on that cover also. It's got one of those last stickers. We talked about that quite some time ago. That that treatment, yeah, makes them sound good. The protector. Yep, and uh, it's it's on it's on the label inside too. Huh. Well, yeah. Okay. Sound good. It sounds great. I'm very happy about it. Cool. Uh, pick this up, the Normals. Now, there's four different Normal bands. There's one out. I was thinking this was the one out of Sweden which I really like. Uh, they're more of a college rock. But no, this is a punk band. Uh, came out. This came out in 78 from uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Huh. <laughs> so it's like, okay, well, I, yeah, they, I might as well just see what it's like. Good punk from 78. You know, it's just they're doing their thing. Is, is it memorable? Is it on any compilations? It is not. But mm -hmm. this is still fun. And we're just about done here. I did find finally got Blizzard of Oz because you just could never get me this supplied. You just yep. could not get this in my hands. Uh, is that a good OG? Uh, no, this is not an OG. Uh, it's it's one. Hey, it's from the mid uh, 2000s. Oh, it's it's in a paper sleeve, so I don't have to worry about hazing. There you um, go. But yeah, happy to have that one. I only need really the first two Ozzy Osbourne albums. I truly need nothing else. And finally, Psychedelic Furs Greatest Hits. Um, I probably will get their first four or five albums because I really, I was a huge fan of the Psychedelic Furs. You know, uh, you know just in the 80s, it's just great music. So uh, this came, yeah, uh, yeah, this, this is just 
great. It has it has all the stuff on here that I want. So all you need, greatest hits. So that's Very it, good. Jim. Yeah, I've been busy listening. Uh, if I'm awake. So what about you? You're, though you had a busy week too. Huh? I had a busy week, but uh, not quite that hefty, mind you. <laughs> but I've got some decent stuff. Uh, ones that I had in the store last week, but because I had limited numbers. I had to wait for a restock before I opened a pair for quality control, but uh, very happy to have uh, the two Rush members' solo albums, Alec Lifeson's Victor album, originally released in 1996, I believe. Okay. Go back to my notes on this. Yeah, originally released in 90, uh, 96, and uh, this has just got some really great guitar work, and it, I mean, it's an interesting album. It's a lot different. I had listened to it once years and years ago but it was only on compact disc um this i believe is the first official vinyl they did a nice job on this i'm gonna have to pull it out of there crystal clear vinyl double lp and originally this was a single i think they expanded it a little bit but some great stuff from uh, the rush guitarist and then not to be outdone released at the exact same time was getty lee's my favorite headache which you would probably get if you listen to this wouldn't you I may, yeah. <laughs> Maybe. Now, this same thing. This was originally released in 2000. Uh, let me find that there. Yep, originally released in 2000. This is a brand new reissue. But, um, again, it wasn't on vinyl until, I think, a couple of years ago. They did a Record Store Day release version of this. And I do have that, the RSD. So I wasn't going to get this one, but they put it on colored vinyl, Steve. Oh, and <laughs> look at you. And... The record store day is nice blue, and then the other one's a nice green, so it matches the cover. The record store day release was on black vinyl only. So now I'm facing the conundrum. Do I need the more rare pressing record store day release on black vinyl, which sounds really nice, or can I listen to this one, or do I want the colored vinyl to match the Alex Lifeson just because, or do I keep them both? Oh, you might as well just keep it all. Oh, th thank you for your advice. So uh, really neat. And the, the Getty Lee, for all intent and purposes, because he's the vocalist of Rush, it's a Rush. It sounds just like a Rush album. Yeah. Even though you know Lifeson's not on guitar and you know that Neil Peart didn't write the, the uh, lyrics and he didn't uh, play the drums on it. But it's it, this may be worth an episode down the line. Or can solo, uh, can lead singers break out with solo artists and not shed that... Uh, that the fact that they're with the bands, that may be a good one down the line to tuck away. Like we'll Mick very... Jagger and Primitive Cool. Oh yeah. Yeah. She's the boss. Uh, same thing. Yeah. So very excited to have those two back in. They, they both released the same time. Like I said, it was a couple weeks back, but I had limited numbers in the store. So I wanted to make sure I had the stock before, before I put my own in. That's how a selfless of a record store guy. You I are. That's <laughs> nice. uh, this next one, I guess this is going to fall under the guilty pleasure. This yeah. is a uh, Steve Winwood's. Ark of the Diver. This is just, it's just a nice album to put on once in a while. It's It's got a little poppy feel. It's got some disco feel released in 1980, of course. You know, and I'm I'm, I'm kind of in that uh, traffic-ish mood once in a while when you get this so much different. But Winwood on his own, I think, does some great stuff on here. But this is a UK press. I, oh. I had a batch of UK stuff come in. And this yeah. one just sort of kind of stayed in my side of it. But uh it's just, like I said, it's one of those albums you put on, just nice background music, very unintrusive. Now, the last one to uh, my ads this week, I was actually pretty excited about. This was an upgrade. I had a, um, a mid-70s uh, version of this, the UK, and it's the Yardbirds self-titled album, Yardbirds. Now, a lot of folks will rely refer to this as Roger the Engineer because of the text that is written down on the cover here. Mm -hmm. And that's not the case. You uh, you get yelled at on Discogs if you try to put this in under the title of Roger the Engineer. They don't like that. This is an interesting um, an interesting album. I had to do more research. I'm I'm I know a little bit about the early Yardbirds, not as much as I should. I do enjoy their stuff, but uh, this was their third or fourth album overall. But their first studio album released in the UK after two or three live and compilations. One now this is. For all intent and purposes, I've got a copy of the U.S. version. This is a U.K. press, mind you. It's a first press mono U.K., which Discogs tells me, let me go to it here, Discogs tells me is uh, quite healthy in that uh, 
in the, you know, it gets up into the hundreds, uh, the low $100 range for that in decent shape. And it's got the, the, the flip back uh, cover on this. Now I had, as I mentioned, a mid seventies UK press, which looked fairly identical to this. So much like Piper at the Gates of Dawn from Pink Floyd, the early pressings of the UK and the US differed greatly enough that this made me want to keep one of each in in uh, in the in, in the collection here, and that is because the song lineups are different. There's songs that are on the UK one that aren't on the US, and vice versa. So and I, you know, I've got a stereo one here, and I did a little research too. The mono and the stereo mixes are are radically different in some cases on this. Again, not an expert on this, but uh, when I was listening to my stereo version before I brought this in and upgraded, you, there's some fan, some fantastic channel separation going on with this. And this one, by the way, Steve, is uh, one of the first, if not the first that Jeff Beck was on. And uh, they, they kind of call this the first psychedelic rock album as with the departure of Clapton, they moved a little bit away from the blues and got into that more psych and almost pop type feel that, okay. that they were really known for under, under Jeff Beck. So very cool. I guess it predates uh, Revolver. So on huh. Discogs, they call it the first psychedelic rock album. I don't know if I buy into that or not, but we'll give it to them. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> but fun stuff regardless. Uh, but I, I do enjoy the Yardbirds from time to time. Hey, by the way, folks, uh, everything that we talk about in our recent pickups and some of the ones that we'll talk about today in the main subject, uh, we do our best to put together a Spotify playlist since we don't put them in clips uh, here in the episodes because of copyright and copyright police will come down on it and you know, they'll get Steve first because yeah. <laughs> they drag you away. Uh, but we put together a little Spotify playlist of uh, some of the cuts from these albums. So at your leisure, you can go back and listen to them as you see fit and have some fun with the songs like we do. Yes. It's a nice and playlist. It is. And you, you put my work uh, cut out for me here today with that big pile you got going in. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. And you're on vacation. So, wow. <laughs> there we yeah, go. So there we go, but we'll make it work and hopefully I'll find everything. So, you know what, Steve? Hmm. I cannot sit on a sealed record. I just can't. Nope. Maybe that's just me. I mean, vinyl is made to be spun. It's made to be listened to. And uh, we've had this discussion over and over and over again because we've known collectors. And I see people that bring stuff in that say, oh, I'm keeping this sealed for X reason. It's going to be yeah. worth a lot more. Or mm -hmm. my thing is to collect sealed vinyl. We knew a guy, Barry, that, uh, that mm -hmm. did that. But for me, it's just, it's it's not what it's for. It's meant to be enjoyed, meant to be listened to. Yeah. So imagine my surprise. And I know that uh, that there's, there's just the seal or unseal is a big point of contention across the vinyl community and collectors mm -hmm. regardless. But now all of a sudden, some of these sealed collectors are getting a little nervous, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they are. And wh why is this? This is because of the hazing that we mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those that as uh, who, uh, as uh, uh, Gomer Pyle would say, surprise, 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 <laughs> uh, yes. when you open that up. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I've had some albums, and I've really considered maybe I should keep that seal because it could become valuable. And and I could sell it for well, you know what? I'm not gonna sell it. I mean, I just know it's not happening. I, I'm not. So I I I kind of got rid of that whole mindset, you know. I just yeah, uh, I you know, I might bring them in and trade them to you or something. Well, now yeah. it's a lot harder to do, <laughs> but uh and I know I brought in one sealed album, but someone, you know. And no, nah, I, I I don't. But it is kind of scary. You don't know what's going on inside of that, especially newer albums. Yep. The idea of hazing, for those that may be unfamiliar with this, and it's not necessarily limited to sealed albums, by the way. And as, as a guy who brings in hundreds and hundreds of records every year in all stages of uh, age and <laughs> condition, I can really attest to what sometimes an inner sleeve can do. But the idea of hazing on sealed albums are that uh, in some cases, and this isn't really limited to the 80s. I mean, I've seen these plastic covers or some weirdly shaped paper covers go back into the 60s, 70s and through there. But more prevalent in the 80s when they started getting away from paper inner sleeves to plastic ones. And then even some of the newer ones, like even some of the MoFi ones people are worried about. Yeah. But over time, 
This is science, kids. I'm not a scientist by any means, but science tells us that plastics break down over time. And if your vinyl record is very compressed up against a piece of plastic sandwiched between it for a long period of time, guess what? That breakdown of the, the at the molecular level of those plastics affects yeah. your vinyl. And that's yeah, what and some, some of these people are finding out. Yeah. And you just would, you know, you know, some of those plastic sleeves, you know, they were thick. They looked like, wow, these are very good. These are going to be really protective of it because of their thickness. And now, now we're finding that those 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 are ones that are causing a lot of problems. So I guess there's some that are even kind of pinkish looking, and yep. they can really be an issue. So what is happening is, is that this breakdown of the plastics is making them adhere to the vinyl. And in some cases, it's destroying the grooves. In some cases, it just affixes to it. And folks are finding that they cannot clean it off. You can't spin clean it. You can't VPI it. You can't ultrasonic clean some of that gunk where it, it really affixes onto there, it just won't clean it off. And all of a sudden, these people that had these, what they thought were tremendously valuable, they're not because the vinyl's ruined. And I think that that's from some of the videos I've been seeing over the past couple of weeks, there's a little bit of panic with people saying, I better open these up and check them. Yeah. And, you know, all of a sudden your, your, your valuable sealed MoFi is just not anymore. Yeah, people are going through their entire collections right now looking at each sleeve and some I, I was listening to one person and I said, well I'm, I'm just changing them all out to these one sleeves I mean wow uh, first off you got a lot of time on your hands so congratulations for that but uh that's a spendy thing but it just doesn't want to take a chance and so they were all going on to those more little special sleeves you can buy from you the mofi kind of sleeves yep. um but you know once but it, it is, that's, you know, some, some, some are doing that because they're all worried about it. The idea again, though, that the keeping something sealed, I get it. And I think we've had this conversation before. I get it. Maybe you're holding on to it. You've got a good play copy. You want one for just purposes of, of holding something that's going to retain the value. But so much can happen when you get 20, 30, 40, 50 years. I've got one here that's sealed 60 years old. We'll talk about that in a little bit. 60 plus. So much can happen inside of that that you can't see what's going on that could just affect the record itself, which then destroys your main purpose for owning a piece of vinyl where you can't listen to it as well. Yeah. I've had you know a number of sealed albums that were very old. And for the most part, I've had good luck. I mean, you're always kind of looking how tight is that plastic on there. If that shrink wraps on really tight, you may have an issue happening. If it's a little bit loose, you may be okay. But, you know, there was a dead milkman uh, one I got. And uh, sure as heck, it got warped inside of there. Uh, yep. You don't know because, again, it's sealed. Uh, of course, if you sell it sealed, then that other person has to worry about it. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, but then for, for us, I always feel bad because if somebody waits and they open this thing up expecting it, and then it's like, well, you know, A, I had no idea. It loses its value when it's open. It, it's a whole... It's a whole uh, box of worms that you may not want to get into. Sometimes. Yeah. Well, one time I just, you know, uh, it was the vinyl record mission. He was talking about, he bought one, it was a two album set. And so he, you know, he's worried about this. So he's opening, he had over 200 sealed albums. So he's looking at them. So he opens up this one. It's the two albums in there. They're the exact same ones, you know. <laughs> so he doesn't have side C and D. He has two sides, A and B. But and all these years, it, it was yeah. just sitting there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So now it's like, well, oh, well, you know, that's what yeah. it is. One of the strangest sealed item stories that I've got was uh, a few years back, uh, I was on this cover kick and I, you know, the, the idea of finding the bands that did something originally where somebody else made it more famous, uh, REM's song Superman was a cover tune and that got me intrigued and I sought out the original which was by a, a 70s psych band, late 60s, 70s psych band called The Click. So I found a copy of the album that had Superman on. I don't have it anymore. I, I kind of moved that through. Um, but it was sealed. And so I, I've got it. It was a good deal. It was like 30, 40 bucks. Brought it in. And so I opened it up. Now this, you're always going to have the question sometime, is this a legitimate seal? Is this sealed properly from the factory? And in this case, I believe that it was because... When I open it up, and I'm going to use this Ray Conniff as kind of an example. This one that I, I started to show, 
um, is a 1962 pressing sealed came in in a collection that I got several years ago, full of about a hundred of them of this era. Yeah. But the seal, I didn't have it on the, on the click album. I did not have any cause for concern to think that it had been resealed, but on the inside, after I opened it up, there was a little index card uh, for ordering extra stuff from the label or something like that. It was just a little insert, but it was inside in between the cover and the paper inner sleeve the card shape itself had uh when, when i moved it, let me see the best way to describe this is through the plastic seal through the cardboard cover somehow the inner sleeve had a little sun fade to it like it had been left out there hmm. so when i moved the index card there was a white spot a perfectly shaped card spot on the outer or on the inner sleeve rather the paper inner sleeve hmm. So the paper sleeve had discolored through the shrink and through the cardboard somehow. And I didn't doubt that it was the original because it was just one single square and underneath it was perfectly white because of the heavy card paper. It was mystifying to me that somehow sunlight and or just aging got through all of those layers yeah. to get to the paper inner sleeve. So what's that doing to stuff that is just sealed regardless anyhow? Yeah, yeah. It was very weird. It is. And, um, but, you know, you'd also brought up the point that, you know, you don't know, is that factory sealed or did someone else just seal it yep. and say, well, it's sealed. It's a, because when you buy it, you just assume it's a sealed copy where it could be a whole different record in there. And that did happen. Uh, we were watching one of these videos, one of these big, big, I mean, big buyers that travel the country. They bought a sealed collection. I saw one of the video where they were, opening up a sample of them. And again, I don't know, they could, you can do anything. I'm, I'm a guy that did video. I know you can make anything happen and look like it's on video, but they claim that they opened up one of theirs and it wasn't what it was supposed to be. And it would have been a very valuable one. So somewhere down the line, somebody resealed it, put a piece of junk inside of it yeah. and went, ha ha, I got them. But I don't know whether or not it's true on their part or the, where they got it from, but this, that's the case. The, the collection I mentioned, uh, we got into the store uh, just about four or five years ago. And there was a, about 100, 200 of these era stuff that would not even sell in our dollar bin, but they remained I, sealed. Yeah, remained sealed for probably 60 years, 60 plus years. Conrad Janis, by the way, uh, Dixieland jazz trombonist, is the actor who played the father on Mork and Mindy. He was, uh, he was a jazz trombonist. Okay. But in this, you can see that this is a seal, but somebody had slipped in a one cent sale. Now, Unless the label was just saying, you know what, we know these aren't going to sell, so we're going to do it. My guess is that this one was resealed at some point in time. Yeah. But probably resealed after it didn't sell, and they put that in there. I but, remember that collection coming in. And, yeah, yeah is there some other of those cards on some other albums like that, too? And I don't know if maybe it was a manufacturer overrun. Well, let's just undo it and put these in. Uh Obviously, they didn't sell. Still not selling, is they're it? Still, they're still not selling. I mean, it's cool to have sealed records, but they got to be stuff that people want for crying yeah. out loud. So, you know, it can damage the plastic. Now, I've got a couple of other examples here. Uh, this one here came in a little while ago. It's the best of Bill Cosby. And this is actually, I think I'm going to, you know, I'm arguing against opening records. But in this case, I'm going to argue that this best of Bill Cosby is probably best left sealed because that way you're assured that nobody opened it up and tampered with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are we going to get in trouble for that? Uh, well, we'll find out. Our lawyers okay. will take care of it. <laughs> there we go. Um, the other big issue with a lot of these are picture sleeves. And they say that when you wear picture discs, rather, when you get a picture disc, the first thing you got to do is take it out of that heavier PVC because more than anything, this type of heavy plastic degrades and sticks to the vinyl. I've seen some of these where you've got to literally peel it off and then there's some vinyl wow. stuck to it. I brought in a little bit uh, collection. I'll show you some of these other picture discs. And immediately I pulled the sticks out of the, the, out of the PVC, but kept this because obviously that's got the hype sticker and stuff. But these 70 picture discs, I don't know if you can tell, this thing is... Uh, massively warped <laughs> you can see it here and through there but yeah the the pvc is supposed to be really really terrible and 
because picture discs, you want to see them, you can't put them in a paper inner sleeve because it defeats the purpose. Yeah. And you can't put them in thin plastic because then it'll rip. So what do you do? If you're the manufacturer, you put it in that heavy PVC. Yeah. Now, the other thing, though, that you could do is you could put a picture disc in a die cut cover. Mm -hmm. uh, like this one. So this is this is the cover meant to emulate the cover of the Who, but the picture disc is underneath it. But yeah. more to your point to what you said earlier, if the shrink is too tight on something like this, I got a collection that's probably got about a dozen of these this era picture discs in. Mm -hmm. And the, the person that sold them to me was all excited. And all I could say was, dude, they're warped beyond belief. Yeah. Not that you can play these picture discs. I don't know if you can see how bad that is. But this mm -hmm. shrink was so tight that it bent the picture disc underneath it. Sure. You got a meatloaf. It's really, it's really a shame. The same thing. And picture discs were made not great to begin with. Mm -hmm. Here's the real kicker. Oh, this Boston is open, by the way. It's not a sealed one. I thought it was, but same to the point. It's got a plastic inner sleeve on there. And then massive, massive warping yeah. happening on this. Now I know that the pic that the picture discs from the 70s and 80s are not meant to be played. They weren't meant to be played, they're meant to be looked at. But even then, it's nice to know that if you wanted to, you could play it. And yeah. in the case of these sealed ones, if somebody were to get them, you'd open them up. They're they're good for nothing at that point, other than looking at. Very true. Yeah. Something put on the wall. Uh yeah, and, and I and I had a few from back then, but not too many. I, I never really jumped onto that bandwagon. But now it's back. I mean, look at all records through day, picture disc, picture disc, picture disc. But you know, I think they're they're being a little bit more careful. I yeah. well, I do see some in that heavy PVC. I think that they're learning to put some of these newer picture discs in the cardboard yep. and, and taking care of them. So the idea, though, with the MoFi, let's go back to the MoFi inner sleeves. And we, we had that little that <laughs> little episode we did on the MoFi and whether or not they were actually using real rice paper with mm -hmm. them on top of their other digital versus analog problems. Um, even with those MoFi sleeves, and again, I mentioned I see hundreds of records come through the store. Uh, we bring in hundreds and hundreds. And some people will take the care to put them in MoFi sleeves. But, and I think we've had this discussion before about inner sleeves in general. But I always have preferred paper sleeves. And once in a while, I'll put in one of the MoFi. But as I mentioned, with all the records I've seen over the years coming in, over time, as they're pressed together, whether it be a paper sleeve or a poly sleeve or one of those weird plastic ones from the 80s, or even the MoFi sleeves, I've seen this with those MoFi sleeves. If there is any kind of wrinkling in there, a fold, yeah. a little tiny crease, over time, that presses and marks the vinyl. It, it, it'll end up as a scuff. It'll end up, sometimes there's noise, sometimes there isn't. But there's, unfortunately, because of the delicate nature of a vinyl record and the grooves that play the music, there's no real absolute answer to keeping it pristine mm -hmm. unless you're so totally careful with it that uh, that it, it consumes all your time. Yeah, I, you know... I, 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 I use paper sleeves on quite a few of mine too. And people worry, well, paper sleeves, it's going to scuff them. It's going to, they're going to move back and forth. Well, yeah. And, and anything can happen. And I, I'm not too worried about that. It isn't like I, you know, going, well, when I sell this, they're going to look at that. You know, when I sell it, I'll probably be dead. So it really doesn't matter to me, <laughs> but my, I will say my more expensive album. So when, when I start looking at, especially like $75 and up, I do put those in a MoFi and, and I've, I've sleeved them differently uh, just because of their expense. But otherwise, there's just too many. And I could buy a whole lot of record albums for those MoFi sleeves. What I pay right. They're not coming down in price either. I finally ordered oh. some more for the store and they jacked up a couple of bucks more. Wow. But yeah. this this is kind of the same thing. I think a record collector that really wants to pinch their, their pennies and watch their budget, the last thing they want to hear is, you know, well, maybe you should be replacing your inner sleeves every few years, especially if they're the plastic ones. And, you know, I, I found, too, that that I will like to replace my poly outer sleeves, you know, whether I know people that some they don't use them, but I do. But those break down, too, although it's not going to damage the cardboard like it's going to damage a piece of vinyl. But again, just plastic degrades, paper wrinkles. And if you're looking to absolutely keep it pristine, then maybe you should consider swapping these things out from time to time. It sounds like a 
kind of like uh, as you were talking about that, like like a sales meeting at at like Mofi. Well, what should we do? Well, let's tell them we should you should change them out every couple of years just in case because in some case. are going to take that seriously. Well, at, at that point, it sounds like a good business practice. <laughs> but, you know, I'm not a corporate guy, and I guess that there's probably good reason for that. You know, but back back to the issue of unsealing records. Being that I've not, I, I'm not the type of collector that um, keeps a sealed record. I, I got looking when we talked about doing this episode. I went looking through my collection, and I think that I really only have two or three albums that are sealed. And the reason they're sealed is because I just haven't gotten around to listening to them yet. I'm going to open them up. Uh, one of them's an old original Grand Funk that uh, I, I've been upgrading because I've got a beat up one. But uh, I don't plan on keeping it sealed. I just haven't gotten to it yet. But I can't imagine the level of anxiety that some of these heavier or high-end collectors are going through as they're watching these other videos from the vinyl community saying, well, you better open up your sealed. If you've been keeping yeah. these things that are over 30 years old, you're asking for it. Yeah. yeah but... Yeah, you know, there, there, there is, there is a chance. There's no doubt that there's a chance that this can happen. But I, you know, if, why haven't we heard? I guess it's been out there, but you know, why haven't we heard a whole lot more throughout the whole, all, all these years about this? Or yeah. where some people just got some of this and suddenly, oh, this must be a big issue. I don't know. That's that's puzzling to me, too, because as I went looking for some background information on the hazing that we talked about, the the idea that the plastic will adhere to the vinyl, I found some discussions going on forums, um, well, maybe a Steve Hoffman one, I'm trying to remember, uh, going back at least 15 years. They were talking okay. about this then, but now all of a sudden, and I'm going to I'm going to toss this out there. It could very well be because of the interconnectivity in the vinyl community and a lot of the videos that people watch. And the channels that they follow, all of a sudden, this has come back to the forefront as something for collectors to be worried about. Yeah, I, I that which which does make sense to me. I mean, that, that is the thing with final community. Something hits and it takes off, man. And so everyone's looking. I got one too. And you, you know, first off, I got it. I I can make a video. Yeah, sure, my album now sucks, but I got a video. <laughs> Let's get that out there. So, yeah, okay. I'm, They're worried about this. I guess, I guess, too, in thinking about this, I would give the advice to collectors who are worried about this. A, if you're going to leave something sealed for the value, leave it sealed. And you're going to have to deal with it down the line. It, it's the same thing. When I bring in sealed records, I'm always tremendously cautious because, A, I'm worried, is it warped under there? I, I do my best to kind of lay it flat and press to see if I can feel some some bend in the record through its seal. You can't always do that with double LPs, but it is what it is. B, is there some sort of fraud involved? Did somebody open this up and say, I'm going to just mess with these guys and put something in there? Or they it's so damaged and they just want to, I mean, you're going to have crappy people no matter what. Yeah. So you worry about that. But then if I bring in a sealed record, then it's on me when I sell it to someone as sealed. And if they decide they're going to open it up and it's damaged or it's not what it's supposed to be, that comes back to me. And so it's different from my side of the uh, the equation than just a collector who may get shafted by picking up uh, something that, that they picked up at a, at a a yard sale or, you know, a record show or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. You got you. You, you have your reputation as a store owner, but you go to a record show especially if you traveled there and then you go home and find it's bad well what are you going to do you know what i got it now i'm kind of stuck with this whole thing yeah what advice would you give to folks i mean if if as as the mayor of the vinyl community steve <laughs> you you've been referred to would you would you advise people to open up their records but I, would should they just be doing that anyway you, you know i i guess for me you know play it but i understand there are people that truly they want to hold it it's the value this is why they're they're collecting they're collecting because it's it's they're looking at the monetary value it's not even so much about the music and you know what if that is what you're doing then i would just say it that's what makes you happy that's sealed keep it sealed i you know you 
point and we eventually sell it? Yeah, it could be, but that's the chance that person who's going to buy it's going to take too. If they've been paying attention, they also understand that this can happen yep, and, yep. you know, it can be a part of it. They may not even, even, even know, but, you know, myself, no, nah, I'm, I'm not going to. I think I recently had found an album that was sealed and I was kind of shocked. I go, what? How, how did that happen? But it was another version of an album. It was a Twin Peaks. It was just a different version. Well, I opened it up and played it. So there we go. I, I now have no sealed records. There you go. I, I love telling this story too. Uh, several years back, and I think I've talked about this on our podcast before. Um, I had been on the hunt for a Rush Snakes and Arrows, the original version. I've got a 200 gram reissue, which is crazy valuable, but that's that's the whole Discogs thing we talked about before. Yeah. But the original one, for some reason, I passed it up and I didn't get the uh, the original 180 gram. And I found a guy um, who's outside of the area. He comes into the store once in a while who had him. And he actually had several copies and they were sealed copies. He's kind of that collector. And so we, we wheeled and dealed and I traded some uh, other Rush stuff that I had just so I could get this early copy, this original copy of uh, the Rush Snakes and Arrows. And he knew that I had a play copy, the 200 gram reissue play copy. Mm -hmm. Next time he came around, he says, oh, you still got that uh, sealed Snakes and Arrows? I'm like, no, I opened that sucker up. <gasps> he was shocked. Why did you open that up if you had a play copy? I said, well. I wanted to listen to it. I wanted to listen to that one. Yes, I have got that. So, so now for me, I've got a copy here at the store, and I've got a copy at home. Life is good. <laughs> it's always good there. And, um, and and you also have that for the yard birds now. You have a copy here and a copy for at home. But they're not the same. So I'm going to have to get four by that logic. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, shoot. So where do you folks stand on this issue of to seal or unseal? Um, <laughs> that is is the it is. That's the question, isn't it? Is this a bigger issue? I mean, yes, if there's some hazing, if there's some adhesion from the plastic to the vinyl, you can clean a little bit of it off. But man, if you're talking like a super sealed, I mean, tremendously valuable record, and you open that up, the last thing you want to do is try scrubbing on that to get some film off of it, yeah. especially if it's not going to come off. I don't see an easy answer for that other than do what your heart tells you, I guess. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if you're worried, then you, you just, you're going, you're going to have to open them. You, I mean, yeah, you have no choice, uh, you know, but I, I would, I would read up on it. I would try to find, is it certain years, certain type albums that you hear more of it? You know, again, I've heard a lot of this stuff from the teens uh, yeah. lately had these different pvc sleeves that are ruining it so re, re research it first and you know kind of get an idea so you know what you want to do i know warner warner brothers toyed with those plastic inner sleeves that had their logos on them in the mid 80s i've got i've seen some sabbath records and yeah. some do records of that era that had the plastic and yeah you want to keep the original with it but i tend to put them in a paper sometimes when i get them in the store and say i'm I'll leave the original with it and let the person decide whether or not they want that original one in there or not. And they can use it that way. But uh, yeah. So I'm curious, uh, have you ever, as, as our dear viewers, have you ever come across this idea of hazing or I've heard it referred to as ghosting or just damage done to your vinyl through a plastic or poly or any type of non paper inner sleeve or even with paper inner sleeves? Uh, let yeah. us know. Or do you have too big a collection that you can't get through it all very often? So you really don't know. <laughs> Steve is going to be in his 90s and he's going to say, well, I'm going to finally get around to listening to this one. And right. I've had this in my collection since the aughts. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's crinkled. Yeah. And all that would right. be good if you still cared. <laughs> I'm kidding, sir. I am kidding, sir. You got too long to go for that to happen. How's yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, but you never, you know what? It it does make you wonder, especially I said the 80s, some of them plastic sleeves, because I I I do know I have them in there. They're I mean, there, and I have I not got, changed them out. I've but now, too. do I want to go look for them? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least with both of us. The number of sealed albums that we have to worry about is minimal. Yes. And you zero. Me, it's That's two right. or three. <laughs> so I'm not worried about that. 
<laughs> yeah. If I open it up at that time and it's damaged, I'm like, well, I probably should open it sooner. Yeah. Oh, well, say you love me. Well, let us know on uh, the comments here on our YouTube channel, or you can comment on the uh, episode on Spotify as well as our Facebook page. Uh, you have been doing pretty good answering some of the comments on the YouTube. Thank you very much for that. It's been a little crazy here. Yeah. <laughs> We could all get better at it, but we'll see. But feel free to connect with us. Just search for two guys talking about records on Facebook or elsewhere, wherever you get your fun podcasts from. And let us know if uh, the vinyl community is overreacting to this or if it is a legitimate concern of damage to those. Yep. We'll Good see what know. happens. You bet. If it continues. All right, sir. Well, I am going to wrap things up with us for this week. As always, great talking to you, Steve. Yeah. Hey, you, 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 you have a great vacation. We're going to take a little break here at the store, but you know what? There's going to be no break in the podcast. I think we've timed it just right. All right. Perfect. Whether or not we can entertain people two weeks in a row is another question. Yeah. <laughs> we'll work on it. <laughs> I'm going to go open up that Bill Cosby rip. <laughs> oh, sorry about that. I shouldn't joke. That's that's nothing to joke about. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, Bill. It's all right. Uh, until next week, my name is Jim, and I'm a record store owner who's uh, a little punchy, apparently. Yeah. Hi, I'm Steve. I'm, I'm a record collector that probably is getting all his albums ruined right now, but oh well. Oh, man. You folks have a great week. You too, Steve. We'll talk to you later. Yep. Bye.